Welcome back young scholars. In this video we will be looking at the empires of the Islamic world and particularly the Mughal Empire. So the big questions you should be able to answer after watching this video and the, and the previous video are what are the geographic, political, and cultural characteristics of the Ottoman, Safavid, and Mughal empires? And then you should be able to compare those empires by identifying the similarities and differences. So in the last video we discussed the Ottoman Empire located in the Middle East, North Africa, and parts of the Balkan Peninsula. We also discussed the Safavid Empire in Persia. Well today we'll be focusing on the Mughal Empire in South Asia, the Indian subcontinent. It's been a while since we've been in India, and so just a couple of reminders. One, when it comes to India, our mantra is, India is very diverse. It's linguistically diverse. It's ethnically diverse. It's religiously diverse. And as a result, it was very hard to unify India politically. So India, for most of its history, is instead a collection of independent kingdoms and villages and principalities. And so India is diverse. That really is the thing to keep in mind whenever we're dealing with India. Now, there's been a couple of exceptions to the rule that India is been politically decentralized. During the Classical Age, if you recall, we had the Mauryan Empire from 324 to 184 BCE, and then the Gupta Empire from 320 to 550 CE. And they're going to briefly unify India, but again, this is not going to last very long. Now, what provides India that kind of lasting stability it's the caste system right it's it's the hindu faith that identified all right if you do your dharma and you get good karma you'll be reincarnated in another life and so that ultimately provides the kind of order and stability for indian society in period three you may recall that islam is spreading east and ultimately it makes its way into the indian subcontinent by way initially of the Ghaznavid Turks, who bring Islam to northern India, and then later the Delhi Sultanate. So the Delhi Sultanate established the model for India, where we have a Muslim minority ruling over a Hindu majority. And we are going to see that as well in period four with the Mughal Empire. So the Mughal Empire lasted from 1526 to 1857. So it was an empire that was around throughout much of period four and then into period five. Now ultimately, especially towards the latter half of this period, the Mughals were slowly being taken over by the British East India Company. The empire will ultimately collapse when the British start taking over and ruling India following the Sepoy Rebellion in 1857. So the Mughal Empire again is in India, which is in South Asia. So the Mughal Empire served as a rare example of political unity in India. Again, the general rule is that India is very diverse, and as a result, it's very politically decentralized. So we have again the Muslim minority, much like in the Delhi Sultanate, ruling over a Hindu majority. And so if we stop and think about that, will that lead to problems? And the answer really is it's going to depend, right, on how much tolerance the Muslim minority shows towards the Hindu majority. So the Mughals sound very similar to the Mongols, and there's a reason for that. The Mughals are going to claim descent from Genghis Khan by way of Tamerlane, who's a subsequent leader, both responsible for the deaths of many, many people. So the Mughal Empire will trace their ancestry back to the Mongols and also some Turkic groups as well. And so this is confusing, I think, for AP students because the, the Mughals claim ancestry from the Mongols. However, remember, the Mongols do never conquer India. That really is one of the only places in Asia that the Mongols don't conquer. So the Mughal founder was a guy named Babur, not Babar, Babur. So Babur defeated the Delhi Sultanate, conquering northern India, and he uses gunpowder weapons to do so. And we're going to see this again as a major similarity in all of the, the empires of uh, the Islamic world in period four. The Ottomans, the Safavids, the Mughals all had access to gunpowder weapons, allowing them to expand. But again, this isn't anything really unique to the Islamic world, because remember, other empires like the Spanish, like the Portuguese, like the Russians, all had gunpowder weapons that they were using in period four. So Babur is going to found the Mughal Empire, but ultimately it's subsequent rulers that you need to be more familiar with, particularly two. So Akbar is going to centralize rule for the Mughal Empire between 1556 and 1605. And you can see in red here the location to which Akbar is going to spread. The Mughal ruler is known as an emperor, 
Below the emperor, we have these zamindars. These are localized princes. They're local leaders who control large territories. Now, as the emperor consolidates power in the Mughal Empire, that by definition kind of means the zamindars are going to lose power, right? So as we transition from a more decentralized world to a more centralized authority, that means that the zamindars, these wealthy landowners, will lose some of their power and status. And we're going to see this in a number of other societies as well in period four with a fluctuation of this class of elites. So the diminishing power of landowning zamindars occurs as power is increasingly concentrated in the hands of the emperor. Akbar was religiously tolerant. That's one of the things that he's really known for. He is going to bring together a number of different religious traditions and just bring them into a room and have discussions and conversations. He is going to remove the jizya tax. Remember in the Islamic world, there's oftentimes a tax on non-Muslims. Well, he's going to get rid of that jizya and allow Hindus to practice Hinduism without having to pay a tax. And so again, this is going to endear him with a lot of the Hindus. He's also going to promote, or maybe a better way to describe it is he's not going to oppress Sikhs. So there is a religious tradition that begins in the beginning of period four in India with the kind of blending together of Muslim and Hindu traditions. And those are two religions that on first glance don't necessarily seem like they could be easily combined together, right? You've got Islam, which is a incredibly monotheistic tradition. There is no God but God. Uh, versus in Hinduism, it is a polytheistic religion because there are multiple gods. But as you recall, all the gods are part of that one universal energy force, the Brahman. So Akbar eventually dies and his grandson is another ruler named Aurangzeb. So Aurangzeb is going to expand the Mughal Empire into southern India. You can see here in pink where Aurangzeb expands. If Akbar is generally viewed as more tolerant, Aurangzeb is the opposite. He's going to reverse Akbar's policies of toleration, which means he's bringing back the jizya. He reestablishes the jizya tax on Hindus and Sikhs. He's going to destroy Hindu temples. So this was, again, something that we were discussing way back when we talked about the Delhi Sultanate. But there was some effort by Muslims to ultimately oppress Hindus in India, and they did this partly by destroying Hindu temples. Now, these policies are going to lead to increased Hindu opposition movements as the Hindu majority becomes increasingly aware of their oppression by their Muslim minority rulers. But we're going to basically kind of put that story on pause for about 100 years because ultimately the British are about to come into India and seize control and essentially oppress both the Hindus and the Muslims. The Mughal Empire is probably maybe most well known as patrons of the arts and architecture. Their most famous monumental structure that they built was called the Taj Mahal. It's built by an emperor named Shah Jahan. And he builds this as a mausoleum or a tomb for his wife. So his wife, as she was giving birth to their 14th child, died. And so he spends nearly the rest of his life constructing this ornate piece of monumental architecture, which really, again, is designed to legitimate the power of the ruler. Whenever we're talking about building magnificent grand buildings like the Taj Mahal, built out of white marble and just immaculate construction, really that's designed to legitimize the ruler's power. So the next thing that you should do is identify some of the similarities and differences between the Ottoman and the Safavid and the Mughal empires. So you could do this by filling out a Venn diagram that looks like this. And here are the questions that you should ultimately be answering in this Venn diagram. First, what is the geographic location or region of these three empires? What religion has power? Third, what is the religion for the majority of the people within that region? What is the minority religion in the Ottoman and Mughal Empire? And that's because the Safavids, it's like overwhelmingly 99% Muslim. And so there is no minority religion. What is the dominant sect of Islam? So either Sunni or Shia. What technology was used to expand the empire? How were non-Muslims in the Ottoman and Mughal empires treated? How did the government manage, control, administer such a large and diverse empire? And then who were the empire's pastoral nomadic ancestors? So again, this is what your Venn diagram should look like. So after watching this video, you should be able to answer this first big question. How did the Ottoman, Safavids, and Mughals unify diverse peoples within their empire? 
And then you should be able to use that Venn diagram to answer the second question about the similarities and differences between the Ottoman Safavids and the Mughals. Thanks for watching.